This will be the next episode in God's Game of Thrones, looking at the kings. And we've made it to King Jehoshaphat. And he is Judah's fourth king. His name means Jehovah is judge. The length of reign is 25 years. He's from the tribe of Judah. His parents is Asa, which is his father, and Azubah, his mother. And the prophets that you'll see that prophesied during his time is Elijah, Elisha, Micaiah, Jehaziak, and Eliezer. And he ruled during the reign of Israel's kings, Ahab, Ahaziah, and Jehoram. And the verses you're going to find him in is 1 Kings chapter 22 and 2 Chronicles 17 through 22. In 1 Kings 22, 45... Look at 1 Kings 22, 45. It says, Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might that he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So notice that phrase, and how he warred. So I want to have the topic for this to be get ready for war. 1 Kings twenty two forty one, And Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. And you're going to notice something about Jehoshaphat is that he strengthened himself. You see, um, 1 Kings 22 talks about Jehoshaphat, and then you go over to 2 Chronicles 17, and it's giving you the same information about Jehoshaphat. So look at 2 Chronicles 17, 1 and 2. It says, And Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his stead, and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed forces in all the fenced cities of Judah, and set garrisons in the land of Judah, and the cities of Ephraim, which Asa his father had taken. You see, serving God, doing right, living for the Lord, and turning down the flesh is a process. It's like working out. And the more you do it, the easier it can become in many ways. You just have to strengthen yourself daily. When you first start, you probably won't have that much strength, but the more you do it, you're going to get more and more strength. Jehoshaphat strengthened himself against Israel. He placed forces in the fenced cities of Judah. He set garrisons in the land of Judah. He knew that Ahab, king of Israel, was a wicked king. He knew that there was a threat there, so he strengthened himself. And each day you need to strengthen yourself. The same way an athlete works out every part of his body. The same way a soldier can take apart his gun and put it back together. The same way any professional from any field fine-tunes their craft every day. You need to strengthen yourself in the Lord daily. I have goals each day of strengthening myself in the Lord. Time for prayer, time for study, time for Bible reading, time for Bible memorization. You constantly want to be making progress towards something and having goals for yourself. And when you lose goals, you lose a lot of motivation and you'll just stay still like you're on a treadmill. You're kind of walking, but you're not going anywhere. And you'll just stay in the same place and wander in the wilderness your entire Christian life. Do you want at least a little, a little strength? Focus on the word and the name of the Lord. In Revelation 3, 8, it says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So they had a little strength for those reasons. You're going to have to strengthen yourself against the threats. False doctrine, the cults, false teachers, Worldly temptations, you need verses for everything, so be prepared. If you have about five verses for all the things you'll face in life, then you have your sword ready. Jehoshaphat strengthened himself against Ahab, king of Israel. You've got to strengthen yourself against all the things you're going to face in your Christian life. You need the meat and the milk of the word. This way you'll have strength when it comes time to fight. So the first thing about Jehoshaphat, getting ready for war was he strengthened himself. You need to strengthen yourself. Number two, seek the Lord God. In Second Chronicles 17, 3, And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the first ways of his father David, and sought not unto Balaam, 
B-A-A-L-I-M. Balaam here is the plural of Baal. You know, Baal is a false god that men worship. Jehoshaphat doesn't seek after Baal. And do you know where people seek strength from today? They turn on the news in the morning, and they hear all the lies, all the fear-mongering, all the brainwashed junk that the news puts out. And they think they are made better by knowing what's going on in the world. This older man that I used to have as a supervisor was always reading the paper, reading articles on his laptop, talking about current events. He tried to talk to me about that stuff, and I'm just completely lost when it comes to that stuff because I've never watched the news on TV more than 15 minutes in my life. It's just a bunch of stuff to make you feel like you have to watch and know what's going on constantly. And he said to me that you young guys don't care to know what's going on. And I never rebuke an elder, but I can't help but have my opinion on things. And my opinion on that is I don't have to watch the news to find out what's going on. I've got the Bible, and I know that perilous times are here. And I know what's going to happen in the future because the Bible tells me. My Bible's a lot far ahead of the news. But men seek strength and assurance through everything but God. They're seeking strength through everything but God. Men seek strength from their pet sins. They get comfort in them. You won't have any real strength if you go to the wrong place for comfort. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. The fact that Jehoshaphat didn't seek after Balaam is a rare thing. That was in at the time of Baal. Baal was on the t-shirts, the magazine covers, the Netflix original TV shows. And the BLM movement was probably really the Baalite Lives Matter movement back then. Jehoshaphat was seeking the Lord his God, not Baal. Second Chronicles 17.4, talking about Jehoshaphat, it says, But sought to the Lord God of his father, and walked in his commandments, and not after the doings of Israel. When I got saved and started seeking the Lord, all I cared about was his commandments, and not doing the things that everyone else was doing around me. And I'm perfectly happy and content being a weirdo and not being like everybody else. I started to seek the Lord. I started to strengthen myself. So get ready for war. Strengthen yourself daily. Seek the Lord. And next, subtract the wicked practices from your life. In Second Chronicles 17.5, Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presents, and he had riches and honor and abundance. Jehoshaphat's faithfulness caused the Lord to exalt him. And Luke 14.11 says, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Second Chronicles 17, 6, And his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he took away the high places and groves out of Judah. The high places is where men were going to worship their false gods and offer burnt offerings to them. Or the people were going there to offer burnt offerings to the true God, but that was still wrong because there was a set place that they were supposed to offer those offerings. And it wasn't in the high places. Because it says in Deuteronomy twelve thirteen through 14, Take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest, but in the place with the, which the Lord shall choose, in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. So Jehoshaphat got rid of these wicked practices. He didn't like those high places, those groves, those idols. He subtracted that stuff. He got rid of it. In 1 Thessalonians 1, nine, For they themselves show of us what manner in entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living God. You need to turn to God from idols. Jehoshaphat was ready for war because when you get rid of the wicked practices, you feel that closeness to the Lord. The next thing. If you're ready for war, you need to strive for greatness even in failure. If you fail, just try again. Keep going. In 1 Kings 22, 42 through 43, 
Jehoshaphat was 30 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. 20 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shilhai. And he walked in all the ways of Asa his father, and he turned not, not aside from it, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. For the people offered and burnt incense yet in the high places. So here it says that he didn't have the high places taken away. So sometime during Jehoshaphat's reign, the high places rose back up again. And sin is like that. You will get victory over a sin, and I mean complete victory. Time will go by and it will rise up again in your life. You need to strive for greatness even in failure. In Proverbs twenty four sixteen, it says, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. You may fall flat on the floor, but you can't stop a man that won't stay on the floor. When I was little, I had these punching bags that you blew up. And every time you punch them, they would hit the ground, but then bounce right back up. That is what you need to be like. Just be able to take punches and just keep getting back up. You're going to mess up, but you still strive for perfection. That way, you can win the battles. The next thing, stay away from compromise. If you're getting ready for war, you need to stay away from compromise. That's when it can be tempting. In 1 Kings twenty two forty four and 45, And Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might that he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? At first, remember that Jehoshaphat strengthened himself against Ahab, the king of Israel. Now he made peace in verse 44 of 1 Kings 22, And Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. Now, I know that Romans twelve eighteen says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. But in the case with Ahab, it's not possible. You can't make peace with Ahab and stay right with the Lord as good as you should be. Jehoshaphat is a good king, but he messed up badly by making peace with Ahab. You don't have to join forces with anybody because you and God are the majority. And I recently seen this preacher who is a King James man and everything, yet uh, he, he was happy that at his meeting that he had, all these different sects of Christianity were there in harmony together. The Pentecostals, the liberals, the megachurch crowd, all of those guys but if he really let it rip and spake doctrine, they wouldn't have been in harmony. You see, this preacher knows the right way, but he didn't tell the right way because all those people were there. And if he did, they wouldn't like it. It isn't a good thing for you to join up with all the other denominations and people who are very slack and have no convictions. They will infect your crowd. All the preachers got rid of doctrine. Because they say it's boring. They say it's dry. And they say that we're just trying to get souls saved. Yet it's the doctrine that keeps you straight. It's the doctrine that keeps you from joining up with Ahab. Ahab people like Ahab don't like doctrine. If Jehoshaphat was concerned with the doctrine, he would have just strengthened himself more against Israel. So sometime Jehoshaphat lost that zeal for doctrine. So you need to stay away from compromise. Don't compromise like Jehoshaphat did. He's a good king, but we all have an error in our life somewhere. The next thing is soft spots for sin are weaknesses. Something good about Jehoshaphat in 1 Kings twenty two forty six and the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. If you continue down a road of compromise with worldly Christians, contemporary Christian music, new Bibles, and secular music, TV shows, and movies, then you will get a soft spot for sodomy. You'll get a soft spot for it. You may think that's crazy now, 
But that is what that stuff is being designed to do. Give you that soft spot. Make you think it's cute. Make you think it's sweet and innocent. Jehoshaphat took the remnant of sodomites that remained out of the land. Sodomites are homosexuals. You may have to work with a homosexual and everything else, but you don't have to have a soft spot in your heart for that sin. Imagine if your best friend was an adulterer and cheated on his wife as a lifestyle. Would you have sympathy for that? Should he have a pride parade for adulterers? Should he have extra rights because he's an adulterer? Absolutely not. You wouldn't say, well, love is love. He can't help it that he loves other men's wives and hates his own wife. You would never say that. Soft spots for sin make you weak. And if you get a soft spot for sodomites, it will cause you to get a soft spot for your own sins. If you can have a soft spot for a man kissing another man in the mouth, then you'll watch anything on TV. You'll listen to any kind of music. You'll let your kids go to anybody's house. Jehoshaphat thought a man ought to be a man, and the women should like them that way, and the women should be women. So, soft spots for sin are weaknesses. The next thing, spread the truth freely. Jehoshaphat knew the value of the Word of God. He would have had Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. I mean, he had all kinds of written word already, even though it wasn't a complete Bible yet. He had Solomon's writings like Proverbs. The king himself was supposed to write himself a copy. In Deuteronomy seventeen eighteen, it says, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. I bet, I bet that he had him a wide-margin Bible with wide margins all around, all around, around all four sides. I bet he had tapes of Elijah going verse by verse through that thing and had a King David reference Bible. I mean, you can tell, even though he compromised with Ahab, you can tell that Jehoshaphat loved the Bible because look what he does in Second Chronicles 17, 7 through 9. It says, Also in the third year of his reign, he sent to his princes, even to Benhel and to Obadiah and to Zechariah and to Nethanel and to Micaiah to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them he sent Levites, even Shemaiah and Nethaniah and Zebediah and Asahel and Shemaramoth and Jehoanathan and Adonijah, and Tobijah, and Tobadonijah, Levites, and with them Elishama, and Jehoram, priests. And they taught in Judah, and had the book of the law of the Lord with them, and went about throughout all the cities of Judah, and taught the people. So they went everywhere teaching the book. And if you're ready for war, then you need to get other people ready for war. The pastors have lost the motivation to get people ready for war just by giving them the book. They don't give them the book anymore. You see, the people, they need to have the Bible laid out. You see a lot of good preaching, but where's the good teachers that can lay it out and help you find out where you're even at in the scriptures? Most Christians know certain verses in the Bible, but if they go to that verse, they don't know the context or anything like that. They know things about the Bible, but they don't know the Bible. So Jehoshaphat was trying to lay, get the Bible laid out for them. And notice what happens in Second Chronicles 17.10. And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the land that were round about Judah, so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. A lot of times, you see, men think that if, you're just, if you just teach the Scriptures that it doesn't spread conviction, and that it doesn't cause a man to live right. But look what happened. They taught the word, and it even caused the kingdoms of the lands to fear the Lord. The lands around them wouldn't even make war with Jehoshaphat. And if you show that you're the real deal, and carry your Bible to work, and be respectful to people, and be consistent, and keep your testimony, then even the lost people, more times than not, aren't even going to mess with you. You know, I don't show any sympathy for people's sins. I don't go along with their sins. And it's still a very rare thing that a lost man jumps me about anything. The world will hate you if you stand up for what's right. But the average individual lost man, when he sees you, he's just under conviction. So that is 
preparing for war. And here is outcomes of being prepared. Like I said, the first thing, your enemies will be at peace with you. In Second Chronicles 17.11, it says, And also, some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents and tribute silver, and the Arab Arabians brought him flocks, 7,700 rams and 7,700 he goats. You see, the Philistines are bringing him stuff. And Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. When you're around the lost man at work, just keep your testimony. Show respect. Give soft answers. Be first pure, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. There's no need to get mad in a disagreement. If you have the truth, you can be comfortable in the truth. Just work hard and don't be lazy and you'll find that when your ways please the Lord that God will cause the lost man to be at peace with you. Just like Pharaoh was at peace with Joseph. Another outcome, the Lord will make you great. In Second Chronicles 17, 12, And Jehoshaphat waxed great exceedingly, and he built in Judah castles and cities of store. You see, the Lord had to make him great. Anybody who is anything is only anything because God made them great. The next thing, another outcome, he had prepared soldiers. They were prepared. If you are like Jehoshaphat and you're prepared for war, then you're going to attract other soldiers that prepare for war under you. And Second Chronicles 17, 13, and he had much business in the cities of Judah. And the men of war, mighty men of valor, were in Jerusalem. He had much business. He had a lot going on. He wasn't lazy. He had some ambition. He had some things he wanted to accomplish and some goals. In Revelation three fifteen and 16, it says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I think he's talking about how he would rather you be cold or hot and not lukewarm, as in he don't want you to just be satisfied. I think Christians get to a place where they feel content with what they have accomplished and that they think they've done enough, so they are just satisfied. They're just kind of coasting along. And if you're constantly preparing for war, then you stay with a goal on your mind. And you don't, you're not satisfied. You're wanting to do more things. You're wanting to get better. Jehoshaphat had much business going on. He wasn't just coasting. In Revelation twelve eleven, Paul says, he, he talks about he don't want you to be slothful in business. He says, not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Do your own business and stay out of everybody else's business. It says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. But if you are ready for war, you're going to attract other people that want to prepare for war under you. In Second Chronicles 17, 14, you'll see this, how it was with Jehoshaphat. And these are the numbers of them according to the house of their fathers, of Judah, the captains of thousands, Adna the chief, and with him mighty men of valor, 300,000. And next to him was Jehohanan, the captain, and with him two hundred and fourscore thousand. And next him was Amasiah, the son of Zikri, who willingly offered himself unto the Lord, and with him two hundred thousand mighty men of valor, and of Benjamin, Eliida, a mighty man of valor, and with him armed men with bow and shield, two hundred thousand, and next to him was Jehozabad, and with him an hundred and fourscore thousand, ready, prepared for the war. You see, Jehoshaphat attracted all these warriors. If you're prepared, <clears throat> then you're ready. They were ready, prepared for the war. Paul said in Romans 1.15, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. It says in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You see, you need to be ready, prepared for war. 
prepared for spiritual warfare. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And notice it says in Second Chronicles 17, 19, These waited on the king beside those whom the king put in the fenced cities throughout all Judah. Are you a soldier that waits on the king? Your king is Jesus.